Because the thing is with sacred rage is it is not volatile and judgmental anger. Sacred rage will not point the finger at an individual. It's more like a wall. It's a wall of no, not in my name, not anymore. We cannot do this anymore. It's actually a very clean rage. It's not cruel. It's not blaming. It doesn't want to hurt anybody. It just wants and needs and most likely will stop all of these unjustified acts against the natural world. You are now listening to the Soul and Wonder podcast, episode 70, Rise of the Divine Feminine with Anaya Sophia. Welcome to the Soul and Wonder podcast, where the conduits of the body, depths of the mind, and atlas of the soul are explored with devotion. Through cultural exchange, Christopher and Sarah and their guests will deliver sacred wisdom from around the globe, uncovering the hidden gems of conscious living and holistic healing, all to empower you on your journey of self-discovery. And now, here are your hosts, Christopher and Sarah. Welcome to the Soul and Wonder podcast. We are your hosts, Christopher and Sarah, and we're excited to dive into today's topic on the rise of the divine feminine, specifically the fierce feminine and sacred rage, and how we can channel this energy for the betterment of humanity. We're going to be discussing this topic with the beautiful Anaya Sophia. And even if you are out there and you are a male, you can still listen to this episode. Do not click off. You have the feminine within you as you have the masculine within you. There is a balance, and Anaya goes into this so beautifully, and we just want you to continue listening through because you will get so much from this episode. But before we get into a little bit about Anaya and what we cover on this episode, please share the podcast. If you feel so called to any episode, we ask you to share this with your friends and family. It helps to spread the word on everything we're doing to create useful content that will bring um, life transformations along your journey of self-discovery. And of course, please follow us on Facebook at Soul and Wonder and on Instagram at Soul in Wonder Love. So let's talk about Anaya. First, I just have to say this sharing this space with her was moving, to say the least. Christopher and I were both brought to tears multiple times as we just explored deeper realms of our own consciousness and shared that with her and philosophized about a lot of things. She's an incredible woman with such a pleasant energy and can take you to those places just by existing. So you're going to absolutely love her as a human being besides just this episode. So who is Anaya? Anaya is a Murifor, in case you don't know, that's a mistress of sacred oils, a mystic and author of revelatory wisdom. She carries an oral mystery that really stirs the remembrance of a continuous lineage with the feminine principle that throughout the centuries has preserved its spiritual dignity without the need for permission or recognition from any other source. Her most recent book, Fierce Feminine Rising, she addresses the obstacles of silence, conditioning, and programming that attempt to maintain slavery to a system that is destroying the earth and our minds. She realizes that true liberation from this influence is unearthed through sacred relationship and how our greatest gift is in gathering and receiving one another's awakening codes. In her book, she addresses head on the many challenges that stand in our way to authentically awaken and the inner alchemy to overcome them. Now, she's written a lot of books. Christopher and I personally, we favor womb wisdom and also sacred relationships and sacred sexual union. But our other books include Open Your Heart with Kundalini Yoga, Mini Size Me, Pilgrimage of Love, The Rose Knight, Part 1, Sophia's Story, Return of the Grail King, Part 2, Logo Story, and her latest book, Fierce Feminine Rising, to be expected to hit the shelves in 2020. 
Anaya has also designed her own clothing range, which she calls Anaya's wardrobe. Her range consists of flowy goddess wear, lingerie, and t-shirts. She has also created her own range of anointing oils called Sophia Temple Oils. Everything she creates has been inspired by the Sophia Isis and Mary line. Anaya lives in southern France right now with her beloved husband, Pete Wilson. Their homeland is a place shrouded in the myths and legends of such groundbreaking visionaries such as Mary Magdalene and the mystical legacy of the Cathars, as well as the romance of the troubadours and their vision of courtly love. Together in union with the land, they take people on their own grail quest into an immersive interaction where an initiation by the feminine principle is almost always guaranteed. They run a BMB in the beautiful village of Puyver called a- Occitania Bed and Breakfast, where individuals and small groups can come and stay, somewhere that Chris and I will definitely be visiting very, very soon, as quickly as possible. And a fun fact, Anaya is also able to conduct baptism, marriage, divorce, and death rite ceremonies. And some of the topics covered on this episode is Anaya's catalyst for her mission on Earth to serve humanity and the collective consciousness in the precise way that she does, what it means when people speak of the divine feminine and masculine energies that exist within and without each of us, the current state of the divine feminine rising at this point in our collective evolution, specifically the rise of the fierce feminine, and how this energy is calling each of us, male, female, and anybody in between, to seek justice and inspire positive change in the world. Sacred rage and the difference between the divine rage and anger and how to channel it properly for the betterment of humanity. How to recenter our personal power after abuse or trauma. The importance of healthy sexuality in a sacred union practice. Anaya also guides listeners through a simple yet profound exercise to work on balancing the masculine and feminine energies within us. And let me tell you, I did this. It is very, very powerful. And lastly, she shares updates on her new book tour and where to keep up with her journey. So enjoy this episode. Let every word infiltrate your entire being and we'll see you on the other side. Welcome back, everyone. We are now here with Anaya and we're just so excited, so excited to talk about this. (laughs) Hi, you guys. So today we're going to be talking about your upcoming book, Fierce Feminine Rising. Great name, by the way. But before we dive into that subject matter, in your book, Womb Wisdom, which has helped me significantly in my healing journey, you mention a powerful story about this homeless man that you met when you were a child. And I'm curious, do you consider that a catalyst for your mission on earth to serve humanity and the collective consciousness in the way that you do? And if so, I would love for you to share that powerful story with our listeners. Oh, God, absolutely. This was... This was the beginning moment. So I was 12 years old. I was coming down the steps of Sacre Coeur in Paris with my mother and father. And I was holding my dad's hand. Mum was off in front. And I could see that there was a young man. I, I often place him at around 25. Sat on most likely the fourth or fifth step on the left hand side as you descend the main staircase and make your way into Montmartre um, market down below. And even as I approached, I was already hugely drawn towards him. And as I passed him, I'm looking to my left and I'm I'm hoping he's going to look up, but he's not looking up, he's looking down. Anyway, as I pass him, you know, hand in hand with my father, I'm looking over my shoulder. I can't seem to let go of this Mm -hmm. man. And so I do something really quite outrageous for my character because I was a very shy child. Mm -hmm. Um, I undone from my father's hand and I ran back to this man. And I knelt down in front of him placing my hands on his because he was sat there with his palms face up as if kind of, you know, asking for something. 
And so I put my hands on top of his, <laughs> which is really not my character at that time, which, mm -hmm. of course, caused him to sort of awaken, not that he was asleep, but, you know, just looking down, and lift his eyes very slowly and lift his head and look at this sort of child in front of him. And as he raised his eyes, as he lifted his head, I could see that this wasn't a homeless man. This wasn't a man who needed anything. His eyes were bright blue, crinkly, moist with like a loving presence. And his face was glowing with with goodness with joy mm. with with welcome and i just burst into tears right there on the spot mm. and sort of like fell in love but not in a man woman way mm -hmm. but falling in love with love because here is the face of love lifting up right in front of me right now and i sort of like clasped onto him and I called back to my mum and dad, and I remember saying something really bizarre, like, Mum, Dad, do something. Can we take him home? <laughs> <laughs> and my mum and dad were horrified. They, you know, they weren't privy to what I was privy to, and they were a bit concerned, you know, what on earth is our daughter doing? <laughs> they tried to rustle me away, but I wanted to stay. I wanted to stay, and, of course, I came away from him, but I, I just cried and cried and cried and cried, not because I was sad, but because I'd seen something. I'd seen something, and I just sensed this, a sense of family, a sense of there's more of us here. And in my little 12-year-old language, it was like that was an angel. Wow. And then when I was in my 20s, I sort of embellished that. I went, no, no, that was Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't really, but it, it was, you know, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. a face of that kind of presence. Wow. I like that you mentioned that, you know, in your 20s, like in hindsight, being able to look at that experience from mm -hmm. a more perhaps evolved state of awareness um, that you were able to see the the infinite power that was in such a simple moment that oftentimes many of us overlook. overlook yeah. Yes, yes. I had the feeling that we had an agreement, me and that man, me and that soul rather, we had an agreement that he would appear on that step at the age of 12. And do you know what? I haven't been back since. Hmm. And I'm I'm 50 at the end of this year. And I kind of feel, hmm, I think this could be my gift to myself to wow. walk down that staircase once again. <laughs> and maybe I will sit on that step and see if a young child goes past and, you know, mm -hmm. I just pass on that same look. Wow. That's beautiful. It was like a, almost an energetic activation of sorts. Yes. Yes. yes well, for sure. And just the co-creative just ability that we all share together to be able to co-create these moments and these synchronicities that oftentimes, like you know, you mentioned, often get overlooked. But when we can tap into that, how powerful and how transformational that was yeah. just that one moment for you. Yeah. yeah, that was it. It was the big heart opening. And it, and it kind of stayed open. Even though teenage was up ahead and a phase of rebel rebellion was up ahead, I always, always remembered that moment. And I always went back to that open hearted place, even though I was, you know, rocking and rolling in, <laughs> in the midst of London and teenage years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like a beacon. And at what point in your journey did you decide to start getting deeper into working with the divine feminine, the divine masculine, and balancing these energies? And we can we have some questions for you too to explain what that really is in a second. But I I would like to hear how you got from point A to point Z. Well, it since that moment on the steps of Sacra Curve, that kind of like what I would call beloved energy um, was was with me now always. 
-hmm. but obviously I had my I had my young younger years to play out which included being a fashion designer in London and being in the music scene and the nightclub scene but still that sort of beloved exchange between the masculine and the feminine was still was still within me but it wasn't until I was 28 of course Saturn's return this is a very typical time where life will deal deal a few curveballs, which is destined for you to kind of look at your life and kind of ask the question, is this how I want things to continue? Usually the answer is no. <laughs> for some. <laughs> That's right. And, and my answer was no. This is not how I wish for things to continue. So this was the beginning of my sort of like inner contemplation. And I made, I jumped tracks at that point. I left the world of fashion and I decided I wanted to be a yoga teacher um, because my mother studied yoga and I would often go along as a child. And so I remembered that quality of peace and restfulness, particularly when it was the time for the relaxation at the end. And I knew that's the energy that's how I want to spend the next phase of my life in that rather than the glamour and glitz of fashion and music. So at that point, I made a, a huge leap of faith. I left my own business, left it to my partner and walked out into the world of Kundalini yoga and teacher training. And then after a year or so began taking, giving classes myself in London. So that was the beginning of entering the inner world and returning once again to that gaze that I saw on the steps of Sacre Coeur. And why did that affect me so much? And what is it, this, this fascination I have with, with love and seeing the presence of love in other people's eyes and sharing that with others? Mm. So that, that, yeah, that was, that was the, the turning point. I now surrendered to, mm -hmm. to what was inside rather than what I was creating outside. You, re you really followed that calling, yes. that pull to, to guide you somewhere um, yes. deeper within your soul. That's beautiful. Yeah. And and I'm so happy to hear that you went on the Kundalini journey. Uh, that Sarah and I both have experienced the power of that. And uh, yeah, our listeners have heard us say many times. We talk a lot about Kundalini yoga was our <laughs> oh, like <yeah>. major <laughs> one of the major catalysts. <laughs> oh, absolutely! I couldn't believe the phenomena that was going on in my body quickly. It it was a very quick uh, initiation. You know, the first class produced such phenomena uh mm -hmm. it was it was a brand new and very exciting experience mm -hmm. so i was just hooked from that very <laughs> first class we always tell people like because we we share about it in such excitement and then when people start saying oh well maybe i should give it a shot we always throw a little disclaimer and we're like if you feel you're ready to have your life completely just like yeah. dismantled in the best way possible, <laughs> then go for it. But if you're yeah. still comfortable being comfortable, then maybe do some more research into starting a Kundalini yoga practice until you feel that calling. <laughs> Absolutely. That's it right there. Yeah. So, so many of our listeners may be familiar with the concept of the divine masculine and feminine, but just in case they're not, Let's start with that basic foundation for this subject. So what exactly does it mean when people speak of the sacred feminine and masculine energies and what is happening with the divine feminine rising at this point in our collective evolution? Well, when we, when we talk like this, we always bring in the immediate awareness that this is an internal marriage and also will be at some point an external meeting and exchange as well. So perhaps if I start on the inside, we can probably all recognize that there's a part of us that loves aloneness and solitude and stillness 
and deep, deep presence with, let's say, the cosmos, with, with something greater than the self. And then there's another part of us that loves community, exchange, intimacy, connection, co-creation, and all the color and movement and sensation of an earthly realm. So that, that one, that one's the feminine. And the masculine is the one who prefers the solitude and the stillness and the presence. So we have these two energies inside. The masculine is also the part of us that drives forward and goes out into the world and creates projects and expressions and and just external things, whereas the feminine is the one that stays within and dreams and visions and imagines. So within us, there is this, I say, dynamic rather than dilemma. Although at first it can often feel like a dilemma because one wants one thing and one wants the other. And this internal expression is often very much mirrored outside in our closest relationships. One is very extrovert, one is very introvert. One likes movement and color and spontaneity and change, and the other prefers things to stay quite still and steady and predictable. And what can happen is that we start pointing the finger at the other one as having a problem because they're so different to us. And hence we enter, you know, what we could call in the bat- in the old days, the battle of the sexes. Mm-hmm. Strong and heavy duality. But now we are most definitely entering a paradigm where this strong sense of duality is it naturally wants to come together now and merge and create this mystical third quality, which we, I believe, have never actually created yet together. Mm. And so the rise of the divine feminine, which is in both genders, male and female, this one that is seeking the intimacy, the connection, the co-creation, the greater awareness of just the self, including nature, the natural world, you know, the whole of harmonious existence. This is one of the greatest concerns of the feminine. I don't mean woman, Mm -hmm. of the feminine. And so this part of us is rising in man and woman. And she is looking for that deep connection with the masculine. The masculine has been operating by himself. Even though I'm saying himself, I don't just mean men. This masculine tendency in our all, in in, in us all, has been operating by itself. And Mm. it's got so far. It can only go so far by itself. It has to now turn and face the feminine that is rising within us to go beyond this duality of masculine and feminine and into the birth of this third and unknown quality that is neither male nor female, but a union of both. Mm -hmm. Mm. And that sacred union that you speak of, you mentioned um, perhaps we haven't quite entered that state collectively just yet at this, you know, time of our evolution. And I wonder, what do you think is possible for humanity and the world and beyond if we were able to bring these masculine, feminine energies into balance to create Mm -hmm. that third? Well, when I look back into our past, I see matriarchy, I see patriarchy, I see a swinging from one to the other over and over again. Lemuria, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, Rome. I don't feel, and there's a lot of us who agree, that we've ever actually been the custodians of this earth in an equal harmonium. 
of men and women, the masculine and the feminine. So all of our governments, all of our education systems, all of our policing and banking and our medicine and our play and our spirituality and our religion, I don't believe there has ever been a time where it has been in balance across the board. Like everywhere you look, you see an equal gathering of men and women harmoniously and with great respect, governing and caretaking and holding these great important seats of power. Mm. Now, I believe if that could be possible, then we're in a a position where we, A, we are actually invited to remain here, and B, something very creative and imaginative and wonderful could actually happen for all nations, for men, women, and children, and animals, and the natural world, and the technology that's looking to come through, and that we leave behind a legacy for our children that they are invited into to thrive and to literally we pass on the baton Mm -hmm. and instead of it being a downward spiral of you know overproduction and destruction leaving behind a wake of destruction and like oops I'm sorry you know to our children we actually leave behind a legacy of light that our children step into and expand upon and expand upon and expand upon. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Because at the core is this balance. I just got curious about something. If let's say we successfully entered into sacred union collectively, mm. what's your opinion on, and this is probably just a philosophical question really, um, with probably an infinite array of answers, but I wonder, would we stay there? Or do you think there's a cycle where we could perhaps fall out of sacred union to repeat the learning experience of polarity Mm. and duality just to Mm. unite again? What's your opinion on that? Fabulous question. From my understanding the ancient civilization called Lemuria. And again, Lemuria, it can't really be tangibly proven that it existed. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's no, you know, archaeological evidence to say this is from the time of Lemuria. Um, But there is in our classic imagination uh, and the, the ancient epochs, there is this understanding that this, civilization called Lemuria existed before Atlantis and that this was a a time of sacred union and perfect holy balance between the masculine and the feminine. And then after that came Atlantis and then came ancient Egypt, times when there was a toppling of power and and a great fall and a great descent and a oops, You know, we're back to zero again. It could happen the way you hypothesized. But where I sit right now, I'm like, well, why would that happen again? (laughs) And of course, it really is just a cycle. Mm -hmm. It's a natural, beautiful cycle of energy. Mm. I'd like to think... But I'm, you know, just a a mere human. I'd like to think that from that sacred union could come new, ever, ever expanding new expressions and new creations. Mm -hmm. But who knows? Yeah, it's it's almost, I was curious to hear your opinion on that because it's almost like a fractal experience of source separating itself to experience itself. And I was thinking about the night and day Day of of Brahma, Brahma, you know, experiencing (laughs) creation and then back to 
nothingness, which yeah. would be full union and then creation. And then, you know, and so I, I, I start to, I mean, when Chris and I go down these rabbit holes, <laughs> it's like you go into a mini existential crisis where you're suddenly like, <laughs> wait, what, <laughs> what is happening? But that's, that's beautiful that we also have that potential to stay in union and perhaps return to that state of source um, yes. when we're ready. And I guess it doesn't really matter if we have to fragment again, because no. it's all perfect. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. Maybe there's one great big storyline that gets lived out in each complete cycle. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, the, the almighty present goes, ah, okay, that one's been done. <laughs> <laughs> on to the next <laughs> so uh i'm curious what is the sacred rage of the fierce feminine and why is it important to embody it and channel the universal outrage rising in us to seek justice for those who cannot defend themselves wow great question <laughs> well I would say, this is just my opinion, in the West, particularly England, and I would say America, even though we are in the female body, we are most likely being driven by masculine energy, which is to go out there into the world behind hyper-productive, super successful, have a checklist of things to do and, and to make things happen out there. I know for a fact I have been extremely driven by my masculine energy and it's never too far from me. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have spent a, a lot of time now definitely not diminishing my masculine energy. So to all the ladies listening, it's not about diminishing. It is about keeping the masculine energy where it is and just encouraging our feminine part to rise up to meet that wonderful and dynamic presence. That is something I've been doing in the last five years. Mm. We're now in a period where we cannot really hide or deny anymore that that super fabulous masculine energy has created an imbalance in the natural world and that the natural world is suffering because of this way of living that the West has been predominantly leading. And the tendency for us in the West, is to not look too closely at that mm -hmm. because we fear that it's going to impede on our super productivity and creativity and industries. So we don't really want to look, especially not so much with the heart presence, at the effect of this, you know, overproduction and industrial way of living. We don't want, don't want our world to change too much. We're super comfortable and super happy with what it's become. But there is a price, and that price is the loss of the feminine. And it's appearing in the loss of the natural world and how that natural world is declining because we've forgotten to bring the feminine on this super dynamic journey with us. As we start to bring our heart to what is actually happening in the world, the plastics in the ocean, we're being told that we're going to run out of fish in the year 2050. Sometimes we hear the, the numbers 2042, that we have been overfishing and basically there's no more fish in the oceans. When we actually start to bring our heart's presence to that, there can be a huge part of us that starts to stir 
and arouse itself deep within the being, and this is the feminine. And this part of us that is emotionally connected sincerely and truthfully to those fish and to the actual regret of the overfishing, this is just one subject, there's so many subjects I could talk about, then that rage, and it is sacred, and that because it's justified and it does need to be there and it is to be welcomed, that is the feminine part of us meeting that super dynamic masculine part of us. But it's big. It is a big, tumultuous wave of energy because it has been shut down and silenced. And so it's 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 like Pele. It's like the volcano on the Hawaii Islands. It's red, it's molten, and by golly, it's coming up now. Mm. And so us Western folk, we like to kind of go, oh, my God, I need to keep a lid on this because it's going to be messy, it's going to be ugly, it's going to be inappropriate, and it's going to be loud and bolshy. But I say, no, come on, beloved volcano, <laughs> come on up, because your voice is true and your sacred rage is justified. And we have made a bit of a mess with with this masculine part of us, we have toppled up. We, we're, we're out of balance with you. Mm-hmm. We need to hear your voice. We need to feel your rage. Come, come, express yourself. Mm. Because the thing is with sacred rage is it is not volatile and judgmental anger. Sacred rage will not point the finger at an individual. It's more like a wall. It's like, you know, Game of Thrones, <laughs> uh, the Northern Wall. It's mm-hmm. it's a wall of no, mm-hmm. not in my name, not anymore. We cannot do this anymore. So it's not seeking to harm a person or an industry. It's actually a very clean rage. It's not cruel. It's not blaming. It's not, it doesn't want to hurt anybody. It just wants and needs and most likely will stop yeah. all of these unjustified acts against the natural world. It's such a potent energy. I I, <laughs> I love that you clarified too between sacred rage and anger. Um, because it's like, basically what you said is that it's, it's not the rage itself. That's the problem. It's how we respond to it and what we do with it. And it sounds as though this sacred rage starts as more of an internal process, the fire that lights within us to get us to care about the state of the world, those who are oppressed, um, and, and just, this chaos that we've sort of created. And, you know, Chris and I, we see in the spiritual communities a lot, um, the spiritual bypassing where anger or rage is felt and suddenly people want to stuff it down out of fear of quote unquote, lowering their vibration. Um, and I, I always say there's a fine line between tolerance and apathy. And Mm. if we're apathetic, we cannot inspire change within the collective. But I love that you distinguish that sacred rage does not act out violently or in a way that seeks to destroy, but instead seeks to rebuild. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it is a very scary journey because you don't know how much deeper is this going to (laughs) go. I mean, it's wild. It's wild. It's unpredictable huge noises come out of your body you, you're when I accessed it for the first time I, I didn't feel like I was human anymore I felt like I was an element I'd become weather <laughs> mm. um but you know as you were saying the spiritual types they don't want to lower their energy their vibration well I have some news for you you don't lower your vibration. <laughs> your vibration expands. Mm. You are now operative within the natural world. You're not an individual human anymore. You expand. 
Mm-hmm. And this is this is what's in this next book, Fierce Feminine Rising. This this great good news. It is a frightening journey. You will not recognize yourself. But then finally, when you come to it cleanly and absolutely, you do recognize yourself. And it's very it's a very similar quality to how you were as as a child. It's very innocent. It's a paradox. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are innocently yourself again. You're not afraid of power. You're not afraid of the authorities. You are now speaking on behalf of nature. Mm -hmm. You you become one with that energy. And, you know, I think talking about this is, it's interesting because in the West, especially in the West, you can see how much we deal with suppression of everything. And when we immediately get out of our comfort zone, um, we automatically want to suppress and, and, and make sure that it doesn't come up and keep pushing down and keep pushing it down. But as you mentioned, it's like that volcano, it's going to come up. And I think if we are to embrace that and go into it willingly, um, although that is never easy at times is to actually willingly go into the pain, into the fear, into the trauma that we can then emerge into, into the light and into this new era, this golden age that we're talking about. Yes, 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 exactly right. And there's so many gifts that get given and if, and it feels pretty much like it's, it's the gifts of the lower triangle, you know, going back to Kundalini. Um, you, you do find your place again on this earth, you know, barefoot on the earth. You are with the natural world. You are one with the elements. Your sexuality, which is highly connected to your voice, you guys must know this from yoga. Mm-hmm. So there is a huge healing that takes place in the second chakra with the gift of like a restored innocence you know, you've opted out of the program, the the matrix-driven program of, you know, goal-orientated sex. Mm-hmm. And you get given the template of a beautiful, holy coming together with another person. Um, the solar plexus is absolutely blasted open. You find your power. You find your voice. You find your ground. And as I said, there's no enemies so it's not as if you're pointing your spear at anybody. So it's a it's a gift of the lower triangle mm-hmm. because we've been doing all this spiritual work, you know, in the higher triangle, the crown, the third eye, the throat, and and finally the sacred feminine, the fierce feminine, gifts us the opportunity to really open up the energies of the solar plexus, sacral, and root. And now, now energetically, we are a whole human being that all those beautiful spiritual qualities can now descend down into our body. And now we're like, we're fully operative. Mm -hmm. And that's the gift of, of stepping in to this feminine energy that is rising within us. It's not about wearing nice dresses and being poetic and and sweet and gentle that's an aspect an aspect of the feminine mm-hmm. there's also this fierce quality as well it you know it sounds like you're really <clears throat> elaborating on how the fierce feminine helps us to recenter our personal power and how that kind of infiltrates into the collective right yes and you know, speaking of personal power and sexuality and that whole topic, you know, on an individual level, many of us have experienced abuse, sexual trauma, um, predatory relationships, um, not just women, but men as well, um, and all mm-hmm. genders. And so how, you know, can we specifically tap into that fierce feminine rising to help us to recenter that personal power? Well, as this journey begins, we have to bring our awareness to the invitation to sexually unite 
with another. So many of us, and I have been one of those people, have said yes when the answer's really a no Mm -hmm. or a don't know. I have agreed to engage with people I don't really want to engage with. I've agreed to engage with people in environments I don't really want to engage with. So all of that must, we must bring our awareness to that. And we have to step out of that little sort of polite program that's, that says yes. And that program is a little bit more um, operative in the females, we we are usually the one who's the ones who are a little bit more obliging and say yes more often when the answer is no. Mm. So we have to learn to say no. No, I don't want to engage with you right now because I can sense you're angry. I can sense you're withdrawn. I can sense your mind is elsewhere or we are. So we must stop I feel, (laughs) sexually engaging when we know the other one's not present or neither is the self. Mm -hmm. And then we have to look around at our environment to see whether the the space we're going to make love in is harmonious and supportive because we're about to open up energetically. Mm -hmm. See, these these are things that we have not been taught to bring into the evaluation. Sexuality, lovemaking is such a creative act. It can either heal or it can diminish. We can lose our energy or we can quantify our energy. And a fierce feminine gives us that power and self-respect and love to dare to say that no when we know it's a no. Mm-hmm. But again, it, it takes a lot of uh, belief that you can say no, mm-hmm. and you know the world's not going to end. It's truly a reclamation process, and yeah. you know, in your book Womb Wisdom, I remember in the beginning of the book, <clears throat> um, you'd mentioned something along the lines of for the duration of your work with yourself throughout this book, can you promise to yourself, can you give yourself permission to only engage in um, healthy sexual relationships that empower you and give you your, your personal power back and to say no when, when those boundaries that perhaps you haven't quite, you know, set up strongly yourself just yet. Maybe you're crossing your own boundaries, right? It's like learning where those are. And, you know, being in a a marriage, Chris and I, we we've done we've done and continue to do and will continue to deepen our sacred union practice together um, as a couple. But since starting that book, um, that was a huge and also your book Sacred Relationships, that was a huge catalyst for even in a marriage, to question when we come together, what's the motivation? Mm -hmm. What is, what, you know, we, and we learned that there are so many expectations that the societal, I guess, mm, image of what a marriage is like, oh, I'm your wife. So that must mean I should always engage when you want to engage, or I'm your husband or life partner, whoever you may be like, and, and we learned when we went to a tantric workshop that, wow, even in a marriage, you still have needs, wants, desires, boundaries, and there is no, it's, it should be unconditional and there should be no expectation. And it took a lot for us to realize how we'd been programmed our entire lives prior to each other, that we had to use our relationship to start dismantling that programming and deprogramming ourselves individually and together. And it's just for people who haven't done sacred union work, I highly, Mm -hmm. highly recommend these books <laughs> mm-hmm. that we've been mentioning um, because it's just, it opens up this beautiful world of manifestation, conscious manifestation and yeah. healing mm-hmm. and love from such a deep level that can't even be really put into words. Well, and also to touch on that, going through this process over uh, how many years now, I don't even know. It's hard to keep track, mm-hmm. but um, just 
coming together in that space and finding and learning through yourself through that space, because like there's things I'm learning about myself of like, Hey, what have been my past habits when I'm coming together? And, you know, I, I think it ebbs and flows and it goes in so many different directions, but you know, when we decided to consciously create our child that's now in Sarah's womb, you know, we spent a lot of time prepping ourselves for that, that moment, that mm-hmm. sacred moment. And that week is, that we spent together, um, creating this, this human and mm-hmm. without having that foundation, um, I don't know if we could have, you know, mm-hmm. what it would have looked like, but this work is so important and I'm so glad that you, you mentioned it and talk about it. And I mean, it's, yeah, I'm just feeling very emotional about it right now, thinking mm-hmm. about it. Oh, bless you guys. Yeah. I, I feel, I feel that week. I, um, you know, as you speak about it, I, I sort of feel the quality of, of what that must've been like to really consciously bring through that child mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm just smiling from ear to ear right now. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, it's a process that requires um, many depths, many layers. And, you know, to, for some people who might be listening to this, they might feel overwhelmed, you know, like, where do I even start? How do I even get involved? Some people may be already at a certain depth that they're feeling called to go deeper. And I just want to mention, I feel called to say this for anyone listening, follow your personal calling, your personal truth, and it will guide you exactly where you need to be and take you to the depths that you're ready to handle. Even if sometimes it might not seem like you're ready to handle it, (laughs) you created it because Mm -hmm. you were ready to handle it. So just continue the process. Keep asking the questions. And just to, pull this back just a little bit. Cause I know we can very much go down the rabbit hole and I'm more than willing to <laughs> go through that stream of consciousness together on this, on this, uh, episode. But, um, what are some, maybe just a few beneficial practices that where people can start to really tap into these energies? What types of pra- I know we talked about Kundalini, right? So what are some practices mm-hmm. that you recommend uh, people start with to really start playing with these energies to really start to get to know themselves and these energies on a deeper level? Well, there's a, there's a lovely little meditation I've come up with and hopefully if I I can describe it well enough it's quite simple basically you sit cross-legged on the floor like you would in in yoga and you look down and you realize that your right arm is your masculine arm and your left arm is your feminine arm and traditionally in yogic philosophy this is the understanding of the energies inside of us So in the meditation, my left hand would lift off my left knee and very, very slowly cross my legs and pick up the back of the right hand and bring that right hand to the midline of my lap. So technically, my left hand, feminine, this is the same for men and women, is holding and supporting my right arm, which is laying in the lap of the left hand. And I'd be encouraging my right shoulder to just let go of all of its control, let go of all of its dynamic, the to-do list, the computer, the checkbook, the (laughs) credit cards, the finances, the school bills, the cars. Just let go, sweetie, let go. And what I'm wanting my masculine self to feel is that it's being recognized, acknowledged, and seen and supported by my left hand, which is my feminine. And this always produces tears. Mm-hmm. And so after, you know, a beautiful song, choose a song that will support that process. My left hand will guide the right hand back to its right knee, give it a little hand squeeze like you would your beloved, and just squeeze and squeeze and just go up the whole of the right arm, really acknowledging the power and dynamic nature of the right arm 
and the way it's kept you financially safe, it's kept a roof over your head, it's enabled you to travel, it's come home with the goods, it's come home with all the resources and kept you safe and kept you comfortable. And then the left hand would return to her knee and then off goes the right hand. It comes across the lap, picks up the back of the left hand and brings her to the midline. Now this is the part of us that may have had her heart broken at a young age, may have lost the flame of love, a few disappointments have kicked in, we're not as open as we used to be, and so the male hand is encouraging her to open, mm. to just go past all of those disappointments, all of those broken hearts, all of those forgotten promises, and again, yogically, let go of the left shoulder. So let go of all the bracing and the protection that you may have placed around your heart and just soften and soften and soften and trust this male hand because after all, it's your hand. <laughs> uh, reveal the depth of your heart. Open up to trust again. And again, it's very emotional. It's a gorgeous process. And after a, a certain song, that's just perfect for the female part of you. You place that hand back on the knee. You give her a hand squeeze. And again, you go up the entire length of the left hand, squeezing and acknowledging. You can do it, sweetie. You can trust again. You can open. Trust me. Open. And then you return back to your right knee. And for a few moments... You truly will be in a state of internal sacred union. Mm. It's very yummy. It's very palpable. I can feel the energy of that. That's. Do you offer a well? You, that's this was a recording yes, of it. <laughs> so do you offer? Do you offer a guided uh, meditation on that for people to access? Well, I actually do. I have a YouTube video showing exactly that, and I can send you guys the link. We'll add it to the show notes of the show so people can start to, they can access that mm -hmm. if they'd like. And yeah, that would be, that would be wonderful. I feel the power of that. And um, it's interesting, just a side note, uh, more of a personal note, I would like to mention, you know, throughout this journey uh, that Sarah and I have spent together, um, we have been this ebb and flow, right? And it's all about coming into balance within ourselves and then as one. And at times, you know, I felt myself so down where, you know, the feminine, that strong, fierce feminine that Sarah has within her is pulling mine up and pulling my masculine up and allowing me to let go and to surrender to that because... And vice versa. And vice versa, of course, vice versa. But, you know, as of, as of late, you know, feeling that energy and, and just letting go as much as I can into that energy because, you know, that masculine part you speak of is, is very much dominant in my life at times. And so being able to really listen and cultivate that. And a lot of times, you know, if I'm being honest, it's really hard for me to let go. And I think that's a lot of the ego that keeps coming up, um, not feeling safe within myself, not feeling, um, yeah not feeling safe within myself. So for me to be able to let go and to surrender to that type of energy and Absolutely. yeah, it's, it's beautiful. It's almost like the masculine can sometimes an, an out of balance masculine can sometimes be rooted in a illusion of scarcity. It seems. Yeah, that is, that is the big concern. Yeah. And it's like that feminine Ooh. provides that, that reassurance of our abundant nature. And then like, That's like funny. you were saying with the feminine, we've been scarred and bruised on many levels. It's that we've created these barriers, the, these walls of protection. And that masculine reminds us when it's balanced, that it can be hold that safe space for us to, to reconnect with the feminine. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I often wonder, you know, these people going out there and making a lot of money, a lot of money. I wonder, I'm sure deep inside 
they know that that level of abundance definitely has an invisible component. They might call it luck. They might, you know, hey, I've been lucky today on the stock exchange. But I wonder if they sense secretly deep inside it's coming, this abundance is coming from the feminine. Mm. It's coming from the grace of being gifted, you know, prosperity, pro spirit. And and the masculine part of us thinks it's about being uh, lucky on the outside. Mm -hmm. When it's not, it's about opening some doors on the inside to let that prosperity and abundance through. Mm -hmm. And... He, not the, not the man, but the masculine within us, he needs to know that that prosperity is coming from the feminine. And so it's not about being, you know, even more dynamic. It's about opening some quiet little doors on the inside so that invisible help can come and, and gift him abundantly. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I often think and feel about the masculine at the moment because my husband, Pete, he is ex-military. Mm. And so he's very much standing in the center of his being now, looking around at the world and the orders that he followed and the systems that he served. And, of course, he's standing there in a place of absolute disbelief Mm. because massive masculine pillars in his world are crashing. And he's realizing, my God, you know, the industries that I served for 14 years, they have not been telling the whole truth. Mm. And so these, these once solid, stable systems are now shaky and and falling to pieces. And my heart goes out to him. But there's also this golden energy inside of me that says, let them fall, (laughs) PD. I got you. I got you. And I don't mean me and Naya. It's, It's the feminine's got you. Don't you worry. There is this golden safety net that's gonna catch you. And put you back on your genuine feet again. Mm. And I just want that message to go out to all the men listening. You may be in a similar place where your pillars are falling, but by golly, there's a safety net out there for you. Mm. And you will get caught and you will get saved and you will be put on your genuine feet. Wow. That's powerful and moves me to tears because that requires so much vulnerability and so much trust and mm. and to be able to <clears throat> tap into that vulnerability and trust is just absolutely life changing. It, it's almost, and I'm feeling through this as you were talking, it's almost as if that feminine energy is is patiently, gently, and kindly waiting for that masculine to step fully into that full power and that potential. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I feel internally. Um, That's what I felt for quite some time that I'm, I'm, I'm almost, if I can put this into some sort of paint a picture, I guess I'm, like climbing these steps, right? And there, the stairwell is super long, and it's. I feel like I'm in these medieval times, but I'm climbing these stone steps, and there's a crown at the top that's waiting for me from mm. the feminine. And if we want to put it into male and female, this this beautiful feminine goddess essence that's holding this crown, waiting to anoint her king, and yeah. that's that's the journey I've been on. I and feel he has it. to do the work by climbing the steps. Yep, yeah. and I feel like I've been climbing. Climbing yeah. and climbing and climbing and climbing. It's like, oh my gosh, it's it's really emotional. It's very powerful. It's I wouldn't trade it for anything. Oh, uh, absolutely. You got it right there. Yeah. Wow. I think we could go 
down so many rabbit holes with you. you- <laughs> that was the first time that I've actually uh, shed a t- few tears on a podcast episode before. <laughs> we might have to bring you on um, again for a part two, yeah. uh, perhaps when your book is released, um, just to update and see. When is that book released, by the way? 2020? It's coming out 7th of January, 2020. Amazing. And an audio version as well, which I'm really happy about because I do use my voice in storytelling. And there are so, so many important things in that book. And I want to put my heart behind it so that the readers and the listeners can feel, you know, like I said about the sacred rage, this is not about judgmental anger. I want I want the people to to really feel the message within the fierce feminine mm-hmm. because it is it's a welcoming and it's an it's not frightening and it's not doomsday and it's not apocalypse it's actually a very heartfelt call t- to union. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of the Empress tarot card for those who are into archetypes and perhaps tarot, the the Empress card that really represents that feminine essence that knows when to nurture, but also knows when to give space, knows, mm-hmm. knows how to create, but knows when the timing is right. And that, that sacred rage is that 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 bridge between the empress and the emperor the the balanced masculine mm-hmm. that creates consciously and not um is not a tyrant or you know mm-hmm. um and yeah. I'm, I'm seeing all these pictures as you're speaking and i'm like wow it's such a beautiful you know moving into the space of the lovers the union and it's it's your your work that you do in the world is so so much needed and um, I love the idea that you're going to do an audio book as well because you have a beautiful voice with a lot of emotion behind it. And I could feel that people will feel drawn to your words. I have. <laughs> oh, guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Where can our listeners follow you in your journey? And um, do you have any updates or anything that you'd like to share beyond your book? Well, I'm going to come over to the States and Canada for like a three-month tour starting in February. I'm, I'm pretty much cu- touching base in all the uh, the usual places <laughs> you'd find spiritual gatherings. So, yeah, I, I will be around uh, February, March, April. Are you going to be in Toronto at all? Yes, totally. Yes. Just, I'll be there more towards April time. We'll be there. We'll be there. We're just okay. uh, we're just a hop, skip, and a jump away from Toronto here oh, in Buffalo, wow. New York. So, Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah, I'll be in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. And what's your website for people to follow? Well, it's it's my name, AnayaSophia.com. Wonderful. I'm obviously, you know, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Got to be on them all these days. <laughs> yeah, got to be on them all. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, to all, all our listeners, definitely, you know, Anaya has so many books um, that we have mentioned in the intro of this podcast. Um, I personally, uh, because of the healing I've experienced from womb wisdom and the sacred relationships, I highly recommend that. And I'm excited for your fierce feminine rising. Cannot wait. Thank you. And I bless the birth of your child. I bless your relationship, your marriage. And I'm very much looking forward to meeting you guys in Toronto. Thank you. We very much look forward to it. And thank you so much for your time today. We uh, very much enjoyed this and can't wait to speak with you again. Such a beautiful woman, such a beautiful space to be in. We hope that you guys enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed interviewing her and we'll definitely have to bring her on for a part two very, very soon. So in the meantime, share the love. Share this with your friends and family on social media. You can find us on Facebook at Soul and Wonder and on Instagram at Soul and Wonder Love. 
This helps your friends and family to open up the doors of perception within themselves as well. We all know that this journey can be kind of lonesome at times. And so the more you share this content, the more you find your community and align with the people who are ready to dive into the depths of their being. So share it, love it, write us a review, subscribe. We love you guys. Your support means the world to us and it allows us to continue bringing this free content to you. 